Ladies and gentlemen, all I can say is <laughs> Terry Malloy. answer is yes, I did know something about Doctor Who because I, I watched it in the early days with um, with uh, Hartnell and Troughton, you know. Um, and then I sort of drifted away, uh, or as I said on radio today, much to Dave's disgust, I got a life. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I, I went to university and disappeared into other things and it was um, as a result of working with a, a director called Matthew Robinson in about 1981. Uh, when I, I'd done a 26-part TV series with him down in, uh, in TVS, Southern, as it was, uh, which was called Radio Phoenix. It was all set in a commercial radio station, and it was about this, uh, you know, all the trials and tribulations of a radio station. And I was cast as this sort of total dork of a, a disc jockey. It was a cross between, you know, Tony Blackburn, Mike Reed, and Snashy and Nice, you know, and you Mike Park, the great brown bear of the afternoon, hello, lady. And uh, I used to do all sorts of silly voices during the course of that um, thing. And a few months after we finished that, um, I got a call from Matthew saying, um, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a Doctor Who. Do you know anything about the Daleks? I said, yeah, yeah, I know about the Daleks, because obviously I've seen the Daleks. You know, he said, but do you know anything about Davros? I said, yeah, I'm going to clear. Who, who, what is that? Um, because obviously Davros came in after I stopped watching Doctor Who. He said, well, come down and, and have a look that um, these tapes I've got. So I went down to the in London and he dumped me in front of uh, Genesis of the Daleks and I started watching it. And um, he said, that's Davros. You know, I said, yeah, fine, okay. He said, we need Davros um, because Michael Wisher is not available. Uh, do you think you could recreate that, that character? And um, like any actor worth his salt, he'd say, well, no, couldn't possibly do that. You know? I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, completely. Um, I'd love to have a go at it. Um, because the thing that intrigued me watching it was that so much of the character of Davros came from the voice. And that had to be the starting point if I was going to recreate this. Um, so I went away and looked at the tapes again and worked out what he'd been doing to create that voice and, and where his character was centered. I mean, obviously, in that one, it was a, it was a very full-on kind of, um, you know, Third Reich intergalactic Hitler kind of <laughs> presentation. But it was a cracking story. It was really good. But I wanted to know where that voice had come from. Um, half of my answer didn't actually come to me until I started to rehearse it. And I was given the mask to wear. And they had to make a completely new mask because Michael's had disintegrated over the years. <clears throat> so I had a head mold done with alginate. For those of you who know what alginate is, it's used for making impressions and teeth and things for you know, very high definition impression. 
and was that, which was then covered with plaster of Paris. So I sat in this chair with two straws at my nose, smothered in alginate, and then plaster of Paris, which got harder and harder and heavier and heavier and crushed me into this chair. And they cracked the back of my head open and split it and made a positive mold for what they got there to then create a mask from. When I got that mask on, I realized that, in fact, it was a very immobile mask. <clears throat> you had to work really, really hard to make anything of the outside move. It was made of foam latex. We're not talking these days when there were all these wonderful prosthetics. Then, it was made out of foam latex, and it was thick, and it was very, very hot. It fitted me completely like a glove, <clears throat> um, so, you know, everything touched, but you really had to move your face a lot behind that mask to get the slightest movement on the front. And I realized that by having to talk in that particular way, you all already had a way of having to talk in a particularly measured way in order to get, your mouth had to work terribly hard to do it. And from that, it was just a case of using that actual uh, delivery, the speed at which it had to be delivered, bringing the pitch down a little, getting a little psychosis into it, and slowly but surely, Davros began to emerge and wanted to exterminate the doctor. And that's literally how the voice came about. It is as simple as that. Um, but that I did really because of what I'd done before, a long time before. I mean, I, we're talking now 1983, from about 1971, I started working in radio. Um, in fact, let's go way, way back. <laughs> back to um, Terry Malloy um, as, a, as a youngster. And uh, my father was in the RAF. And I always wanted to be an RAF pilot. He'd been a pilot during the war. He was now um, checking corner. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, how many eggs? Well, I've got a kitchen for call out for I'll be coming out to pinch chips later. Um, <laughs> my father was in the RAF, and um, at one point in the, in the mid-50s, we were stationed, or he was stationed out in Aden, and for the one time in my life, I was actually released from boarding school, which I went to at the age of five, and taken with them. So I spent three years in Aden and Nairobi uh, with my parents. Now, we're talking the mid-50s, and that was the time of the goons. And in Aden, there was a thing called the Aden Forces Broadcasting Corporation, which was run by the RAF, <coughs> basically run by all the airmen. And it had this little studio in the middle of Cormaxa base, uh, and in fact, contained the only air-conditioned room in the entire uh, province of Aden, which was the studio. The studio was air conditioned. Nowhere else was. The record library wasn't air conditioned. And in those days, they used to get, from sent out from England, big transcription discs and ordinary discs of all the records, um, which in 120 degrees in the shade, um, which was generally at Aden, not long before they all started to warp. So how do they managed to play these records. Well, they had their cunning device, and they would have a sheet of glass, they'd put a record on the sheet of glass, they'd walk out into the sun, put another sheet of glass on top of it, and hold it until it flattened in the heat of the sun, run it into the air-conditioned studio, slam it on the turntable, play the record by the end of which it was starting to go again. <coughs> well, my mum actually worked for Aiden Broadcasting Corporation as um, the forces and family favourites link, and um, the party Sheila's Lives with Mother and all that, and did one or two other programmes. And of course, we used to get the Goons shows sent over, big, you know, massive transcription discs, which had a whole half an hour on. So they were big, they were really big, big discs. And I got to listen to these before they even went out. And at the age of nine, I was like memorising these discs and doing all the voices. You know, I was just recreating all those voices. I found I had this facility to just recreate the voices. And, you know, being, you know, Dennis Bloodlock and, and uh, Eccles and, and uh, Neddy Seagull and things like that. And I just delighted in it. Um, and then used to delight, well, I don't know if I did delight, but I certainly bored people to death 
by then, <laughs> replaying all the records at school in my, you know, my own inimitable fashion. So in this way, you could say that was a kind of the beginning of a, a seed there. Although, in fact, the seed had been laid a lot earlier because my mother had actually been on the stage from the age of 12. Um, she left, she was a Geordie, and I'm a Geordie, and um, she left home at the age of 12 uh, to join the juvenile troupe and work in variety. And she and uh, two sisters worked with all the greats of the variety, you know, in the 20s and 30s. Um, all around the country. It was only when she married her father that she actually gave up working on the stage. So I suppose the stage was kind of in my blood. But I wanted to be a pilot. I didn't want to be an actor, I wanted to be a pilot. But uh, it soon became fairly evident that as I, you know, couldn't distinguish between red and blue, um, uh, that wasn't going to happen. And I certainly wasn't going to be an armaments officer or a navigator or anything else. My eyesight was just not good enough. Um, so. That went by the by. So I thought, right, fallback position is I'm going to be a vet. That's what I want to be, a vet. I want to do something interesting and fun and interesting, and different things happening every day. So that was what I was going to be, a vet. So that was all in control trade, all planned. I've been got in touch with the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and going through my own levels and everything. Came out the other side of my own levels with not one science subject. <laughs> in fact, it took me three goes to get maths. So it became fairly evident that I was not going to uh, go into, uh, into medicine or veterinary medicine anyway. So I thought, okay, well, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Um, um, well, I like music, and I did music. I studied music at school. I played clarinet, and played clarinet well. And so when it came time for university, I decided to go to Liverpool and study music and drama. I quite like drama, and I was doing drama at school. So I went off to, uh, no, in fact, I decided I would apply to be an actor. But my father had just died. He, um, he died when I was the age of 16. And I applied to several drama schools, including RADA. And it um, became evident that the only way I'd be able to afford to go, because we were living in Bournemouth at the time, and they were quite happy to pay my fees, but not my subsistence, uh, for a drama school, university difference in time, um, it meant I would have to get a scholarship. Um, although I was offered a place at several drama schools, uh, I was not offered a scholarship. I mean, the mentor had spent my entire life um, working in bars and sweeping streets and everything else in order just to keep myself going. So I thought, well, I'll go to university instead, at which point Bournemouth threw money at me to go to Liverpool to study music and drama. Um, which was great, actually, because um, it meant I went up there with my clarinet and my saxophone, so I also got a saxophone by then. We had a modern jazz group, and I was playing baritone sax. <coughs> and within about a couple of weeks of being at university, I met up with some guys, one of whom played in soul band. He said, oh, come and sit in with us. So I sat in with them and joined the Big T Buncombe Band, which was a 10-piece soul band. And in those, in those days, we're talking 65, 67, um, Northern Soul was the big thing uh, in and around Manchester and Liverpool. And we played relentlessly. We played the cavern all the time. We used to pick up groups um, on a Monday night, people like Manfred Man or The Herd, and we would be the warm-up band for that act. And we would take them all the way around the northeast into Manchester, over to Liverpool, up to Carlisle, waving goodbye, and then starting in with another group and taking them through. So I used to spend very little time actually at the university. I mean, most of the time was out on the road. But we never got any money out of it. We, we didn't play for money. Everyone had jobs. They were either, either students or they had jobs, proper jobs in the post office or hairdressers or things like that. And um, we just played for the fun of it. We enjoyed playing for the fun of it. And we became really quite a good band. Um, I used to arrange the brass section. We had a five-piece brass section, um, two saxophones, trombone, trumpet, um, and, a, and a, a, two trombones, trumpet, and two saxes. And, um, we were doing some really good stuff. Um, then, towards the end of my university time, the final year of which, having done music for most of the time, the final year was a purely practical year doing drama, in which I worked as an unpaid, um, well, as a student assistant, to the directors of Liverpool Playhouse and the Liverpool Everyman, six months in each. And that was fantastic. That was better than going to drama school. Because I was sitting watching, alongside the director, people like John McHenry, Peter McHenry, Susan Fleetwood, Bruce Miles, 
all, uh, Peter James was the director, Dick Tucky was the director of the Playhouse, phenomenal plays being done um, by new writers, by you know, classics and everything, and getting this amazing insight of how the whole craft of acting works um, in, in terms of stagecraft. At the same time, playing. Now, towards the end of my time, there was a move in the band to go professional. And we've been approached by several people to take us out on the road and to cut a record and all of this, that, and the other. And um, some of them thought this was a good idea, but as soon as they started to talk about it, then all the arguments. And we've been really, we have 10 of us really getting on really well. The minute professionalism came into it, the arguments started. Well, I should be getting this, and I should be doing that. And, you know, when you're talking about money and splitting it up, and I just thought, that's not what I'm, not what I'm doing this for. I'm doing this for the crack. I'm doing this because I like it. So I said, well, I'm out of here. You know. And also, part of me realized that much as I'd like to have been a musician, um, and I still do get music, um, a professional musician was you know, a, a route I was looking at, I realized that at heart, I'm actually amazing. And um, I'd have to work really, really hard to be as good a musician as I'd want to be. To be a session musician, to be you know, a really good, solid session musician working all sorts of... Not in a, I didn't want to be in a superstar band, I wanted to be working all the time and arranging stuff. And I thought, but it doesn't come as easy to me as acting, and acting's dead easy, and actually there's more days off. <laughs> so uh, I think I'll go for acting because I have a basic thirst for insecurity. So um, in fact, um, I, I then went and applied to this children's theatre company down in London and got a job. I was offered a job in the days when they did actually give jobs to people from university. And I got an equity card as a result of that in the days when equity cards were like gold dust <coughs> um, because they were allowed to give away two, two free equity cards a year and I got one of them. So in 1968, I started my professional career working in um, schools, working in children's theatre, in Theatre of the Round. And that was brilliant, because we were doing three little plays for five to seven, seven to nine, and nine to eleven year olds. And they were all done in the round, and it's all uh, community involvement with the audience, or audience participation all the time. So you are having to deal with, and there's one thing you learn of as an actor, is you cannot hide from children. You cannot be less than truthful with the children. They spot it a mile away and they tell you, you know, give their eyes, give away their, their attitude is to you. Forget it. No, you're out of here. Burger. Burger. Yes, Onion rings. Onion rings. Onion rings, burger, for the doctor. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> He's having a lot today, the doctor. He's to put up with a lot later. <coughs> so, yeah, so I started working in children's theatre and uh, that was a joy because, um, you know, I'd done a bit of teaching, actually, when I was at university. I, 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 you know, somebody had asked me to go and do some, some, you know, supply teaching, sort of helping out in a couple of schools, you know, which I found great fun, but very difficult. Because if you're the drama teacher and you want to take, you know, some kids into the hall, you've got so many hoops to jump through, which you're not allowed to jump through, and you can't do that because so-and-so is using it, and you can't be noisy because you'll interfere with the French class next door, and you can't do that, and you can't, have the, the, you can't move the chairs around to the back because we've got a, a meeting later, and all of this. As soon as I came back, like, you know, a month later, as an actor in children's theatre, what do you want? Anything. Yes, we'll clear the hall. Yes, we'll, we'll dig up the playground. We'll do whatever you choose. You're the professionals. You know what you're doing. But this is odd. But anyway, <laughs> we started work, I started working in, in, in kids' theatre, you know, and um, that was great. And it was an eye-opener. I mean, we worked before village schools, we worked big schools um, all over the country. Um, we did primary tours, we did secondary tours. And I did that for about two years, including um, directing one of the tours. And I think one of the sanitary lessons was um, one school we went to, and I remember very well, we went in and there's... Uh, we always, always used to do it in the round, and the kids used to come in and file into the hall and sit around us in a big 10-foot circle, so they're really close. And we'd have little entrances that we could come into, and everything happened, and very minimal costumes and props. And these kids were marched into the hall, you know, regimentally marched into the hall, sat around in this circle, and then the headmaster came in and said, Right, we've got the theatre company in today. So I want best behaviour from everyone in the school. Sit up straight. Hands on your heads. 
I want to see nobody moving. And I want to hear no talking. In fact, not a sound at all. These are nine-year-old kids. Five, five to nine-year-olds. Not a sound at all. The first boy or girl I see talking will be in my office later. Right. Carry on. <laughs> I rush on and say, Hi, everyone. My name's Terry, and I want you all to make the sound of the sea. Come on, everyone. Let's make the sound of the sea. You've got these poor kids. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, make the sound of the sea. <laughs> you know, and, oh gosh, you know, but we got it. We so, that was a great grounding for me because we was not having sort of really done a professional sort of drama school training, but in a sense I think I escaped some of the worst horrors of drama school in terms of all the speech lessons and fencing lessons which you never then ever use again. Um, and um, it was great. So I moved on from there into um, doing some rep work. And I went to work at Stoke on Trent at the Victoria Theatre. And the Victoria Theatre in those days, we're talking like 70, 1970, 72, um, was a bit like Stratford uh, with Joe Nicklewood doing creative stuff like What a Lovely War. The Vic in, in, in Stoke was also well known. Again, it was a theatre in the round, but it was well known for its documentaries and its sort of gritty, hard-edged, you know, northern attitude to, to drama, you know, where it wasn't full of poofs and stuff like that, you know, and these <laughs> and did stuff, you know, with really good playwrights like Peter Turson and, and, uh, and, and uh, Alan Aitborn and uh, people like that um, involved in it. So that was, a, that was a new departure. And while I was doing that, I got... Uh, seen by uh, a director down at uh, Birmingham, who was a radio director, and he invited me to come along to do a radio play, which I did. And then when I left Stoke and I moved down to Birmingham to take over a job uh, at uh, a theatre down there, um, working as an actor and then eventually as associate director, I started doing more and more radio plays, which was great, you know, and um, you know, these were in the days where it was all terribly stiff upper lip radio acting, you know, and um, my very first introduction into a radio play had been in hysterics because we have a spot effect person. Those of you who have or haven't been in, in radio studios, we have the actors at the microphone with their scripts. So anything that they have to do in terms of rattling teacups, opening doors, drawers, rummaging around is done by what they call spot. And this is a person who has all these bits and pieces around. Anything that can't be played in from the booth is done live on mic. And the very first one I, I did was a, a Saturday Night Theatre in which I played a, bit, a villain. And uh, it was full of, you know, sort of, you know, all right, Mr. Jenkins, you know, be careful now, this gun in my left hand is loaded. You know, <coughs> point out exactly what's going on. Ending up with a big fight, you know, so, all right, all right, give me a, uh, 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 bang, there's a shot that comes through from the thing. And suddenly the spot effects man drops to the ground <laughs> inside me, you know. And I just went, ah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, stop, stop, stop. No, no, he's the body falling. <laughs> That's it. Right, okay, we go again, you know. But that is the nature of radio. Radio, I thought, like, this is a great medium to be in. This is great fun. You know, there's none of the angst and, and scorn and drang of, of television and, and even stage, you know, where you don't have to learn the lines, they're up there on the page, you know. Uh, that's a start, you don't have to get dressed up in silly costumes, you don't have to wear makeup on, you know. You can roll in and, you know, two days later you finish the job and you go away again, you know. You're not there for rehearsing for weeks upon weeks, you know. And again, from my lazy nature, I thought, well, this is, this is the ideal job for me. So um, I, I carried on doing it. And um, I mean, over the years, there have been some bizarre physical things that you had to do in radio in order to achieve the required effect. Um, most of which I won't go into here because they take too long and I will tell you about them in the bar later. <coughs> but um, when I've had a few more. <coughs> but from that, suddenly out of the blue I got a call from um, uh, the Archer's office. It rang me up, about 1972. Uh, saying, um, we've had your name given to us by Tony Cornish, who was the head of radio drama at the time. Um, would you mind coming in and auditioning for a, for a character? And I said, yeah, yeah, fine, you know. Now, I was, I was not a great archer's listener. I knew about the archers. But our family weren't great Ambridge listeners or anything like that. 
I vaguely knew about Dan and Doris and things like that, and Walter and what have you. And so I went in and um, they, you know, greeted me and said, hello, welcome, you know, this is Dan Archer, this is Doris Archer, this is Walter Gabriel, and here's the script, and if you'd like to come to the studio, we'd just like to record this scene, you know, with Dan, Doris and Walter. And, um, you know, uh, the character is this, he's a sort of a, he's a kind of a, a union man, he, he, he's, he's just coming in to take over as herd manager of Brookfield Farm, so you're dealing with Dan Archer. And, so I did this scene, you know, and they all disappeared into this box, the, the control room, and <coughs> said, you know, I get the odd thing like, uh, can you make it a bit slower? Uh, can you just bring the voice down in pitch a bit, make it a little bit deeper, you know? Fine, okay, that's great. And then came out and said, yeah, that's lovely, fine. Um, you start on Monday, your fee will be seven guineas. And we got paid in guineas in those days. Mm -hmm. BBC still paid us in guineas, or the equivalent of guineas. We called them guineas, and was whatever it was, but anyway. Um, so that was my, my first job, was, it was late on 72, so it actually went out 73, the first episode I did. What I didn't realize was that they'd already cast the part. Mike Tucker had already been cast and had recorded one episode with another actor called Gareth Armstrong. Gareth then accepted a job with the BBC Radio Rep in London and was therefore not able to do any more archers and they needed the, the character. So they decided to get rid of him straight away and replace him. But the fir that first episode had gone out, so they had to replace him with somebody with the same voice. And what they were doing was re-recording that scene with me doing what Gareth had done, and they were listening to it on the speakers, so we are getting this, you know, can you make it a bit slower, bring it down in pitch, yeah, okay, fine, until they got the match. <coughs> and that was it. And so, I was told it was going to be for five weeks. Uh, just five weeks, <laughs> little job, you know, 38 years later, and they're all there. <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, it, so that, that was the beginning of the arches, really, and, uh, Mike was a curmudgeonly swine, um, union man, activist. And my first interaction with fans of the program, like fans of Doctor Who, um, was I was actually on tour with Prospect Theatre Company um, up in uh, Darlington. And we were doing a, a production about uh, the, the, what's it called? Circle of Glory, yes, it was about Henry V and the, the mixture of the, oh, a Shakespearean kind of, oh, what a lovely war with Henry V. And they had a playgoers party after the first night, and I was down in the bar, <coughs> had a pint, and I was standing there. And this little, very lovely little old lady came up to me, and she said, "Excuse me." I said, "Yes." She said, "Are you Terry Malloy?" I said, uh, "Yeah, yes, yes, I am actually. Yes, you're Mike Tucker in the Archers, aren't you?" I said, "Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you. Kind that you should know. You know." Suddenly, I was hit across the back of the head with this bag. What do you think you're doing with Phil Archer, you little toe bag? How dare you! Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> you actually asked me if I was Tony Malloy, you know. I just read the lines, you know. So that was like the first indication that people do take it a little seriously <coughs> from time to time. Um, as I discovered later with Doctor Who as well. So, um, um, yeah, so I then carried on doing um, all sorts of. Uh, theatre jobs, more and more radio, and uh, a lovely uh, director, Roger Pine, took me on board and basically enabled me to learn my radio craft at the microphone. He just cast me in virtually everything he did, um, culminating in 1981 with a, with a uh, play called Risky City, which had been written by um, an author, Ron Hutchinson, who'd written several telly things um, <coughs> about Northern Ireland and, and various really good pieces, really good uh, playwright. And it was um, it was a bizarre play because it was, it actually took place inside this kid's head after he'd had his head kicked in in a car park in Coventry after having a fight on Saturday night. Uh, having said that, it was a very funny play. It was very darkly, darkly humorous. And it, as I say, it all took place inside his head with this heart monitor going in the background. So that a lot of it was in, in verse, as, and he actually brought back into his head, he was recorded in what they called then binaural stereo, which was, in effect, they had this microphone which was like a person's head, and you walked around it. So wherever you walked was where your voice was going to be if you listened to it on cans. 
you have to listen to it in a very particular system of, of uh, you know, which is why it didn't take off. And you need about 27 speakers in very specific places in the room, or you listen to it on very high definition uh, headphones. And um, Boko, you brought all these people into his head, his mum, his dad, why did you move to Coventry? You know, why did, you know, ah, we followed the works on, we have to go where, you know, we were the blacks of them days, you know, the Irish was the blacks of them days. And then he interviews his headmaster for letting him slip from the A stream into the C stream because he listened to his mouth breathing mate. You know. It was a very strong and powerful play, which literally ended with him deciding to turn himself off. And you just, the final noise is the, as it goes. Strong play, and it won the, what is now the Sony Award, um, well, it won me the Sony Award um, for Best Actor in 1981. Um, it was played once, it was never heard of again. <laughs> So much so that I couldn't even find it. I couldn't, I kept trying to beat it. Go to the archives, they couldn't find it. A month ago, a friend of mine who works for the script archive of the BBC said, I've just been being, doing a trawl. I found Risky City in the British Library. It's in the British Library sound archive. So I have now just paid out £58 to have them to transcribe a copy of Risky City onto DVD, onto, onto a CD. So I've actually got a copy of my own. All I got was a tatty little sort of cassette copy that I done off the radio when it first went out. Um, <clears throat> most of which had been chewed by the dog. So, <laughs> um, so you know, I, my career was burning along in, in radio, you know. But up till then, I'd never had an agent. I'd never bothered with an agent. I didn't see the, the need for it. You know, why should I pay somebody to get me work when I was getting all this work? And I was getting a lot of work. Theatre work, I was working at I worked Midlands Arts Centre, then I went to Birmingham Rep, I was doing a lot of stuff at Birmingham Rep. <coughs> and um, but that's how I realised I wasn't doing any telly at all. And out of the blue, I got a call from a, a producer at Pebble Mill, um, who was a telly producer. And uh, he said, um, Terry, he said, um, I've put your name forward um, for a film that's being done. Um, Jasper Carrot's doing kind of a documentary thing. And uh, he, he wants somebody who can be a good brummy drunk, and your name sprang to mind. And he <laughs> Thanks very much, yeah, great, busted. Um, he said, anyway, here's the number. It's a company down in London, it's London Weekend, and have a co production of Apex Film. Uh, give them a ring because they're waiting to hear from you. So I rang them up and I said, yeah, great, lovely, yes, we've been heard about you. Uh, lovely to come down and meet us, and, and we'll try to match you up with another actor. You know, um, uh, we're seeing people on Saturday. Um, on I said, oh, oh, Saturday, I'm sorry, I'm in the studio Saturday, I'm recording. Oh, right. I said, okay, there, some, uh, Monday, no problem. Uh, yeah, well, we have to see people on Saturday, but we make decisions because it's close to shooting time, you know, so I said, oh, all right, fine. Uh, so, but give us a ring on Monday, you know, if, if we haven't sorted something, we'll, we'll, we'll get you down. You know, so I rang on Monday and said, no, sorry, we had to, we had to make a decision, we're with somebody. Sorry about that, you know, uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Damn, you know. I don't mind losing a job when I've been seen, but when I haven't even been seen, I just think, ah. Um, so that was it. I thought nothing more about it. Um, in the interim, I'd actually been doing a play at St. Leicester called All Together Now, which is about a brass band, which is a, kind of the first time I'd really used my musical skills. Because um, <clears throat> it was pre brass off and pre shilling blowers It was a, a play about a tatty little Midland brass band that was played for the fun of it. And then this northern um, conductor comes down, having been made redundant, and joins this community and decides to take them on board and, and, and bring them up to speed and turn them into a you know, third section band. And basically kills, kills the joy of the, of the experience. Now we had 16 actors on stage who all had to play brass. And we, what the audience heard during the show was uh, very bad versions of Jingle Bells and Abide With Me. And, you know, they think, well, you know, okay, they're acting what you expect, you know, that's as much as they can manage. In fact, what they didn't know was that we, we actually could all play very well. Because at the very end of the play, the theatrical tour of force is that as the band is dis disintegrating under the regime of this fascist conductor, they decide to play the third section to the test piece, which nobody's actually heard. They've only been snatches of rehearsals. Nobody's heard it being played. So, right, we're going to play it for the first time. And so the audience is thinking, hey, yeah, yeah, of course, but, you know, you're going to talk about it. Okay. Bam, at 
Whoa! Uh, it really was a, one of those woof lifting moments, at the end of which, of course, everyone just disappeared. So, we'd done it at Leicester, we were going to do it down in Greenwich, and I'd gone down to Greenwich to meet up with the director, because we were sorting out the dates and everything. And while I was at Greenwich, um, I got a call from the stage manager, he said, I've had a call from your, your wife at home, and um, um, she said, can you call this number, because they've been trying to contact you, so they fine. So I phoned this number, and it was Opix Films, for people who, you know, who do this character, who do this character. And they said, you know, hi, Terry, listen, sorry, we, you know, we meant to get back to you before, but, you know, really, uh, we were so sorry about the character, and, you know, it didn't work out, but we're doing lots of other projects. <coughs> we just wanted to ring and say, you know, if you're ever down in London, do come along and see us, and we'd love to take you out for a meal and just chat about other things that we're doing. I said, well, I'm actually in Greenwich at the moment. Said, oh, great, well, why don't you come round? You know, we'll take you So I went to their place, which was in Soho, and they took me to my little bistro, and they wined and dined with me, and talked about what I was doing, and what I was, had coming up, and when was I doing that, and things like that. And, uh, how, and how tall are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm going down five, three, five, seven, yeah, yeah, fine. Carried on through the, at the end of which, thanks very much, lovely to see you, sorry about the kind of thing. That's it, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be in touch, we'll sort something out, you know, so I get back on the train, go back up to Birmingham, I arrive at my house, and I'm standing there with a bag, saying, right, there's your passport, uh, you've got 20 minutes to get the train up to Manchester, tomorrow morning you start filming with Jasper Carra, and the day after that you fly out to Spain for six weeks to make this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. What had happened was that the actor that they'd got originally from had dropped out. So they called me in to interview me over a meal and just see how drunk I could get. <laughs> I obviously passed that test. So, and I, yeah, I, we went up and we went, went off to Spain and uh, spent six weeks. So that was the first telly I'd kind of done, actually. It wasn't the first. I, I'd done another one while I was at Stoke, but that's, that's another story. Um, as a result of that, um, I got to know some of the people at London Weekend Television, the casting directors. One of whom I discovered was the girlfriend of an old mate of mine, an actor friend of mine, and she was now at a casting. And uh, we got naturally, and she said, ah, oh, yeah, because you could... And a lot of the stuff we did on the carriage, she was made up. We had no script. We didn't even really know who we were. I just knew I was going to be a brummy drunk called Kevin. Um, heard of was a guy called Wayne from Manchester, who went out to... Went, took, he took a stuffed donkey out to Spain, he didn't bring one back, he took one with him. <laughs> And, uh, and, and uh, Jasper played Sago the Plumber, the Grubby Plumber. And we just sort of made stuff. It was meant to be a documentary, but all the documentary elements fell to bits. They weren't really good. So we were sat there for six weeks trying to make a comedy film, not knowing who the heck we were, with no script, and making it up as we went along. <laughs> and a lot of it actually was quite innovative and, and, you know, kind of worked, but it didn't work because people didn't really understand what we were doing. I suppose we say it was alternative comedy before alternative comedy really came in, sort of young ones without it being the young ones. Um, but Nicky sort of said, yeah, all well, that stuff you didn't count, really good. Um, I've got this show we're doing, um, it's a sort of a, kind of a, it's kind of, it's a bit like Candid Camera sort of thing, you know, um, where we go and we, you know, we set up these things, and people get, you know, suckered into doing things, you know, um, <coughs> with which Jeremy Beadle's fronting, the thing called Beadle's About. Uh, I wonder if you'd be interested in having a go of that, you know. So that was it. I did five series of Beatles about. Usually as a friendly man from the council, he'd turn up on the clipboard and say, um, yes, yes, you're having a nuclear power station in your van garden, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we get the letter? <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry, I don't understand the problem. Um, is it the colour you don't like? Yeah, I'm going to paint it on the house if you like, because you don't like the colour. <laughs> uh, so I spent several years being shaken warmly by the throat by various members of the public. Um, and eventually left it because it, it stopped being fun. It, it, well, it also stopped being what it had originally intended to be. And it just became a way of actually making people look silly by drunk, drop, dropping beans on them. And that's not what I joined that for. You, know, you just get them into a... Into, you know, there were people on work experience and they come in, they think they've got a job, they took them into a factory and have a big can of beans explode all over them. Well, I'm sorry, there's no skill in that, it's not fun, it's kind of fairly demeaning to the people. You know. The ones that actually had history and had 
you, you turned up and the guy arrived home and found his entire lawn had been dug up and there was a gas board there, he knew exactly why. Because he had four years of stopping the gas board from digging his lawn up in real life. And we found out about it and done it. Or his wife had told us about it and so we done So we didn't have to say what we were there for. He knew what we were there for. And he was there, he was a ballistic moment the minute he hit, we didn't have to say, look, who comes to dig up your lawn. He knew why we were there. <coughs> and those were the kept because once you've got somebody locked into that, you could then do all sorts of things around it. And it was to do with property. It was to do with wrecking cars and taking roofs off houses. And I think, well, I'm sorry, don't get prissy about it. It's going to be there after you're dead anyway. So, you know. But when it got to do with relationships and people's <coughs> aspirations, that's when I thought, no, this is rather sad. And I, I decided to leave. So, um, but as a result of that, I then got an agent um, through doing all of that. Um, I then started to have an agent who got me other work, including uh, <coughs> Radio Phoenix, from which Doctor Who emerged. And um, so we're up to Doctor Who and uh, Resurrection of the Daleks. So I arrived to do Doctor Who and uh, <coughs> meet up with Peter Davison and the rest of the cast. And I prepared the thing. And, we go to the Acton Hilton, as it was so called then, the rehearsal rooms in North Acton. Uh, and they had you know, like eight, ten floors of rehearsal rooms, you know, four massive rooms on each floor, all doing, I mean, everything was there from Morgan and Wise through to Paul Daniels to Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. Everything was being done before the rehearsal in the days when we used to rehearse. And those were great days when we used to have time to rehearse things. We would rehearse them for, you know, two weeks before we actually went to hear the studio. You know, nowadays, you turn up, I'm doing a film at the moment, you turn up, you get into costume, they set everything up, they say, right, can we have you in front of the camera? Okay, now we're going to get a line up. Okay, can we just run the lines? Yeah, fine, that's it, okay. Right, and roll, and you do it, and that's it. It's no time for the you know, <clears throat> all that has gone, sadly. So, uh, yeah, so I did Doctor Who, and um, played Davros, and thought well, that's good. That was a job, two week job, lovely, fine, okay, bye, see you, and that, thought that was it. Didn't realise that mm, two years later I'd be sitting here talking about Doctor Who. <laughs> um, or the power that that character had, you know. Uh, but they came back and asked me to do it again in Revelation. And it was then that we started to work on Davros and said, well, you know, we kind of recreated what had happened in Genesis and Destiny. But there's more to Davros than that. There's more to that character. There's got to be more to that character. Otherwise it becomes car caricature, becomes two-dimensional cartoon. <clears throat> there's got to be something else. So we started to look at that, you know, and in Revelation we started to bring in some elements of black humour into it, you know. Um, so you get, you know, lovely lines like the doctor saying, you need to tell me you didn't tell people you were feeding on their own relatives. And Davros is Certainly not. I believe that would have created what is termed consumer resistance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy's actually got a life outside being, you know. <coughs> and actually, when you look at that, and people talk about being, you know, the evil of Davros, I say, well, actually, what is the definition of evil? You know, where, where does that evil start? What makes you say that was evil? That Davros had actually solved the problem of hunger in the universe. He actually fed the universe. Okay, he'd use people's dead bodies to do it, you know. He could have made some give and take here, you know. But as far as he was concerned, he'd solved the problem. Why were you getting on this case about it, you know? Yeah, yeah, siphoned a few up from not from Darwin's, but that, you know, that, that's by the bar. That was the little twitch that turns him from being a genius into being an evil genius in other people's eyes, because people's perception of evil. Nobody sets out to be evil. They set out to do what they think is right. <coughs> and that's exactly what Davros did. And um, that, in a sense, sowed the seed that came to fruition many years later when we did the I, Davros uh, mini-series, when we actually had the opportunity to look back and say, right, let's do the back story of Davros. <coughs> what happened? Where was, how did the journey? Where was the journey? He started off as a 15-year-old boy. You know, and where did he end up? He ended up as this monster. Now, he wasn't like that at the beginning. How, what were the journey, what were the milestones along that road that brought him to that point where he created the first Dalek? And why did he do it? 
Was it for his own vanity? Was it for his own self-aggrandisement? Was it for some other good that he thought was going to be there? And uh, <clears throat> that was the beginning of my kind of walk with Davros, or, or chariot around with Davros, my wheel around with Davros, you could say. And uh, then, of course, they, brought, they asked me to come back to do Remembrance, and I very nearly didn't do Remembrance. Because I was actually working on another show for um, Central at the time called Tales of Sherwood Forest, which was nothing to do with what I'll say right now. <coughs> it was all set in the present day uh, in a wine bar in Nottingham called the Sherwood Forest. <coughs> and the Sherwood Forest had been taken over by this, this guy called Rick, uh, called Rick, who had these delusions about being Humphrey Bogart and wanted to turn it into Rick's bar. As a blank. So it was it was a series that was set up by Alan Plater, and he then farmed it out to new writers to write the various elements of this thing. So <clears throat> we got this very bizarre situation of these flashbacks into Casablanca, where all the characters in the real time today then become characters within Casablanca. And I at that time was cast as basically one of the Nottingham Crays, the three of us, uh, playing the you know the basically Nottingham Nottingham's underworld. Who then became obviously the Nazis in the in the uh, in the Casablanca version? Well, we were right in the middle of filming and everything with this, and then Remembrance came up, and the Beeb wanted me, and the director I was working with said, "No, I'm not releasing you. I can't release you because we're doing filming, we're doing this, that, and the other, and it's going to be terribly complicated. I can't possibly do it." So now I'm going to blow. But bless them, John Nathan Turner and the producer of Tales of Show got their heads together and cut a deal. They said, "Okay, right." We'll have Terry in the morning, you can have him in the afternoon. <laughs> you can only have him for one studio day, which is actually on location shooting. So there was a lot of stuff that I was meant to do in Remembrance that I didn't do, like the battle computer. I was meant to do the voice of the battle computer. So that everyone thought it was Davros. <clears throat> so in fact they got John Leeson to do the voice of the battle computer, the little girl in the battle computer. So I literally just did one day in the Texas flip top barbecue um, yeah. uh, with the open for garlic. <clears throat> and again, because we didn't want to let the cat out of the bag, JMT came to me and said, Look, if we put your name down, everyone's going to know it's Davos. What can we do? I said, OK. Um, rearrange my name into a well known phrase or saying, and you get um, Roy Tromley. Mm -hmm. Terry Malloy becomes Roy Tromley. So the Emperor Darling is played by Roy Tromley. And actually, nobody got it until it went out. But strangely <coughs> enough, I have received a letter from somebody who's already got my autograph, who's playing Davros, asking if I could get Roy Tromley's autograph. They've like, <laughs> <laughs> been trying to track him down. And in fact, one of the guys who does my website, he's got this fantasy where he wants to set up this kind of alternative universe where Roy Tromley does exist. <laughs> and he's really bitter, because it's a bit like Dave Prowse and Darth Vader. You know? yeah. But he was. Davros, you know, but I, the actor, have taken it over, you know, and he was the physical body of Davros, but I, Terry Malloy, have taken over his part, you know, so we, we set up all these scenes of doing, you know, interviews with Parkinson and everything, with Roy Trump, very bitter and twisted about the fact that he had been taken away from me by Terry Malloy. So, um, yeah, so that was my career, which I thought was then over in Doctor Who. And, um, and I disappeared into, you know, relative obscurity of doing voiceovers and radio plays and theatre stuff and bits of filming, you know, you got three and Ugly Deeply and what have you and other bits and pieces and other radio, other tellies and <coughs> uh, Bill and the usual rare stuff that actors do. Uh, until about five years after the Doctor Who finished, uh, <coughs> somebody got tracked down by somebody who ran conventions up in Manchester. He said, you're a dad for us. I said, well, I walk. He said, yeah, I've been a long time ago, you know. Well, would you come and do a convention? I said, well, well what do you do? You know, I didn't do nothing about that. Oh, you just come along and be insulted by people. Be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm up for that then, yes. I'm going to sit home and be insulted by my wife. I'll go <laughs> to Manchester and be insulted, yeah. So I then started doing um, convention. The very first one I went to, which was at Hyde, uh, no, the second one, actually, I went to the second one I went to, I met Michael Wisher. <coughs> the one and only time I met Michael Wisher. Whoa. And uh, we were the panel together. And he was actually there doing a play called The Trial of Davos, <coughs> which he had written with Kevin, who was the chairman of High Fundraisers. 
running the, the convention. <coughs> and um, they asked me if I'd actually come up and play, do this, play Davros again. And it was so close to having done it, you know, I just said, oh, I couldn't possibly. <coughs> it's so difficult, far too difficult. You know, I don't think I'm going to be there for both days anyway, so ah, uh, no. You know, and then I said, oh, well, I could come up for one day, you know, but by which time they decided they'd get Michael's you know. So he basically locked himself in a hotel room for two days, learning all the part and doing it, you know, at this sort of end of Saturday night little event in that hotel in a room not dissimilar from this. Um, and that was the first and only time I met Michael. He's a nice, lovely guy. And we chatted about things. And um, um, and then it was years before I met Dave Goodison, who played the second Dav Cross. Uh, that was pure, that was you know, literally only about four years ago. Which is amazing, because actually Dave Goodison does a lot of radio. And I'm, I'm amazed that we never actually met on radio, you know, with, with, the, with the, the stuff we've done. I mean, I've done over 600 plays on radio. And, poetry and prose readings and stuff, and um, Dave's done a lot of stuff as well. But, um, so yeah, then, so I started doing conventions and, uh, um, and getting dragged around all over the place. And, uh, but the thing I liked about conventions came about really from in 1991. <clears throat> I had the idea of setting up an Archers fan club, mm -hmm. because there was none. All people who listened to the Archers had was the programme. So I went to the BBC, I said, look, why don't we set up a company that will actually service the people who listen to the programme? You know, have a fan club, we could produce merchandise if they want it, we could do events, conventions, all that kind of stuff. They said, we can't do that. I said, no, no, we'll do it, the cast will do it, you know. So eventually they, they agreed, providing it was the cast and not some outside body. But the cast set up a company themselves, separate from the BBC, and they were all shareholders, and uh, everyone agreed to do it, <coughs> and we started doing it. So we did. We started in a very small way, in people's homes, printing out little, you know, copies of the Ambridge Village Voice and showing them out to people and getting memberships in and doing the occasional little convention at Pebble Mill for 200 people, and, and you know, and it grew like Topsy, you know, and um, we suddenly realised we were lot, doing lots of stuff, but. Uh, it was only growing to a certain level, and we knew it would no, never grow beyond that. But we had, we started to move away from just doing all of it ourselves to really into partnership thing. I suppose the killer for myself and Headley, who were at the time, who plays Kathy Burns, um, running it. The, the great thing that we liked was the fact that what we wanted to do was interact with the people who listen to the program, because the arches, a bit like Doctor Who, I suppose, and, and uh, programs of, of, of an ilk that have got a following. It's a bit like being part of a giant extended family. There's a whole range of people from all sorts of backgrounds, all walks of life, but they've got one common love and desire is for a particular program, you know, which is dear to their heart. And when they all get together, they share stories about it, share their favorite bits of it, their not favorite bits of it. You know, some get terribly obsessive about it, some do it, treat it with their tongues planted firmly in their cheeks, you know. And um, so, you know, where everyone says, you know, Doctor Who is full of anoraks, I say, well, Archer's Addict is full of barbers. <laughs> they just have a different sort of wax jacket, really, that's all. Um, but everyone enjoys themselves, and that was the point of it, was to actually interact with people and have a, have a good time. So that's why we set up Archer's Addicts. Um, but the, I suppose the crunch point came in, in 2001. Am I running over time? He's looking at me. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Me stop you. Wouldn't you wouldn't <laughs> In 2001, it was the 50th anniversary of the Archers, and the BBC, in their wisdom, decided not to do anything about it. <laughs> so, so there they go. Gosh knows what's going to happen on the 60th. Probably nothing again. <clears throat> um, there was an event held at St James's Palace, uh, which Prince Charles was there for, with you know, various speeches and you know, a little bit of cabaret from dead ringers and things like that. But there was nothing done for the fans, you know. Um, so we decided to do a big convention. We said, okay, we'll do a big convention. And in our naivety, Hedley and I sat down and said, well, what should we do? We'll do, we'll do a really big convention, because we just done them at Pebble Mill, you know. And the, the maximum number of people you had at Pebble Mill was about 200, because they couldn't get them in and out of the studio. So, well, why don't we transfer it all out of Pebble Mill to somewhere else? What a great idea. Where should we go? 
National Indoor Arena in Birmingham. Why not? Yes. In our naivety, we said, yes, let's, let's take on the National Indoor Arena, home of gladiators and indoor athletics. And we're going to do a whole day's event for the archers. And we managed to scrape together a budget of about £32,000. We thought, wow, this will be fine. You know, we walked in the doors of the National Indoor Arena, and they sat us down and, you know, explained us very carefully and, you know, in very polite terms that actually, you know, £32,000 would come about cover the hall costs, but all you've got is a big empty building, you know, how are you going to fill it, what are you going to do with it, you know. <clears throat> but actually a lot of people rallied around, including the National Indoor Arena, I have to say, and um, we ended up um, doing um, a one-day event in which two-thirds of the hall was converted into Ambridge, with a stage, a village green, uh, of a mock-up of the studio at Pebble Mill, a cookery demonstration area, a bulls court, a uh, country dancing area, uh, a place for people to talk to members of the cast, um, all sorts of uh, stalls and trade stalls and merchandise, artists, addicts, village shop, things going on. 48 members of the cast, we got along for that thing. And then the other third of the, uh, of the uh, arena was curtained off. And there we had a big stage. And in the evening, we produced a one and a half hour show, which was basically The Archers, This Is Your Life, which Nick Clark from Then The World of One presented, with all the cast and DJs. And we had four and a half thousand fans come to this event. And our budget had ratcheted up to about 182,000 pounds by this case. <laughs> And we walked away at the end with £2,700 profit. <laughs> Which is why, frequently, it says never again on <laughs> my forehead here. Because everyone yeah. said, why don't you do something for the 60th? And both Eddie and I go, never again. I think we've been saying that for many years. Now. I think you probably, I mean, most convention organisers would know this syndrome. You know, you get to the day after, you think that's it, never again. Never again. No, it's, it's the day before. The day after, we're going, hey, we should so do let's, that. Let's do another one. The day before you start. Yeah. So that was, that was the beginning of Archers Addicts, which in a sense is very much, you know, made me involved in conventions. Um, I enjoy it because I've enjoyed organising them. It, it was a learning curve like I've never experienced before, but it was a great one to be on. And uh, you meet a lot of interesting and lovely people as a result of it. Um, and that's why I enjoy doing small-scale conventions. I won't go to big corporate conventions. I won't go to memorabilia. I won't go to um, you know, collector mania or anything like that. Anything that is run by uh, big corporate people who are there purely to, you know, make money out of fans and see fans as cash cows that they go to milk. I'm, I'm not really that interested. In, you know. um, it's um, because they, they treat people with no respect. And actually, you are the people who made the program what it is. If you weren't here, if you hadn't kept the flame burning in the days when Doctor Who was put away forever in terms of the BBC, then uh, it, it wouldn't have the following it's got today. And that requires respect from you know the people who made the program and the people who were in the program. And uh, I think you know. I don't say it's a duty, but I enjoy going to, to meet with fans who are part of that, that scenario. You know? And um, very much so. So that's why I'm, I've been delighted to have been invited down here today. So I've talked now for nearly an hour, or probably more. <coughs> I'm going to just throw it open to questions. If anybody's got questions at all, I'm <coughs> more than happy to answer them, um, providing they're not liable, because apparently <laughs> 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 I'll be liable in the bra bar later. Yes. Hello. Um, in Bane Davros, when he gets more and more excited, yeah. a certain pitch happens in the voice. Yes. Have you ever, have, um, do you actually strain, do you have to practice to get that um, tone onto the voice, or is it uh, the, that a microphone trick or something? Like no, that? That, that, that you have to really, you have to basically, it's pacing yourself, it's like a runner. Right. Voc it's like a vocal run. You have to know at what point you're going to go to, otherwise you'll peak too soon. The reason I say it is in Plymouth, there used to be a tour guide on the open top buses. Yes. So I'm there with the microphone. Oh, right. And early season, you did three hours without a break. 
warm. And high season, you need four hours without a break. So you're trying to find five minutes to put the liquid in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just talk solids of vegetables, yeah. talk for that entire period of time. Yeah. And of course, you found you'd have six months off and start again. And at the beginning, you would find that you're trying to. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I was just curious whether you found a similar problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the long speech is the rant, what I call the rants. I mean, the thing I like about Davros is when he's not ranting. I like him when he's quiet and sinister and dealing with, um, dealing with uh, the doctor. <coughs> because, I mean, the interesting thing I found out about Davros when we came to do I, um, I Davros was looking at where he came from. How did he get to that point? Because you know? these were questions we had to answer when, as, as the writers were all getting together to put it together. Um, we thought of the format was by Claudius, so patrician family <coughs> comes from a you know a, a, a patrician family, <coughs> and obviously there is influence, political influence there, whether he holds it or or not is another matter. Um, and talking to Gary, who was who was the director of it, you know, I said, well, for me, um, looking at the way Davros had been portrayed over the various, I said. For me, a starting point has got to be the fact that he has actually, he has a, 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 a genetic problem, which could probably be Asperger's syndrome. But he's, he suffers from Asperger's. He is brilliantly minded, he's savant in terms of science. But he cannot cope socially with other people. He, he doesn't understand the interaction, the social interaction with other people. And he sees a problem, and he sees the way to get to it. And if anybody's in the way, he'll blow them away, as happens in Idabos. He, you know, he uses his own sister as an experiment in order to further his end, you know, because she gets in the way. And in Davos, the, you know, and in Idabos as well, he, he kills his own lover, Charm, you know, who he was, he was in love with. Davos in love, hello, you know, it happened, you know, but it to a purpose, you know. And that was fascinating, looking at that journey of, you know, so that we found where the menace came from. And so the, you got somebody who wanted to do things, and he, he had a great ambition to do things, and do good. He wanted to win the war for the Carlips, you know. He saw his people being decimated in this war. He realized, he came to a point of realization that there was no winning this war. It was the ultimate no-win situation. Both of them would annihilate each other eventually with, with radiation or with poison. You know, they were poisoning the planet, they were poisoning each other. <clears throat> the only way to then triumph was to be able to cope with the poison the radiation, mm -hmm. genetically mutate to a point where you had the genetic advantage over the other people, because whatever they threw at you wasn't going to hurt you. And that was where you took it from. The interesting thing about high doubts is that the first Dalek is not a Carlin. The first Dalek is a Thal. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't believe a word of this. <laughs> you listen to I Davros, you'll find out. Thals, scum. Scum, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. But the first Dalek was a Thal. Thal DNA used to create the first Dalek. And that's what you hear right at the end of the scene. The end of the scene. We, we laid down chasm for Davros and, and the creation of the Daleks and where that all came from. And um, that, for me, has been the great thing about being involved in Davros. And, and, you know, I say probably become a total sad sack about it. <laughs> Far too much about him now. Um, <coughs> I can actually just walk away and uh, you know, get a life, as I said. In the <laughs> so, yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of film and television actors have a piece of clothing or a prop that taking it off and they take on the character. Yeah. Can I ask you, as a, as a voice actor, particularly when doing the audio plays, obviously you're not going to put on all your Davros and they've got to do Davros, how do you put on a character with, with no prop? It's a, so mental, it's, a, it's a mental cloak, basically. You see the character in your head. <coughs> you visualize, I vis well, I, I can only talk to me. <coughs> um, I visualize how the character is, how they look, <coughs> and as a result, how they walk. I mean, yeah, if I'm doing stage or I'm doing film, for me, it's, it, a lot of it comes from the costume that I've got, and um, um, the way my hair's done or whatever, you know. Um, 
that informs a lot about the character. As I said, the Davros wearing that mask informed the way he spoke. <clears throat> so that was the, you know, because you had to deal with this rubber mask. Um, any other character, I go very much by what jumps off the page at me. When I read a script, um, I always remember Peter Sellers saying that for him the moment of creativity was the important moment, and then after he got bored, when he was filming. It was the first time he did it, you know, which actually you can say, well, that's bad acting, because you should be able to recreate it every time, that exact same feeling. But you don't completely, because you've, you've done it already, you know. So you're recreating something, you know. And the skill of a good actor is to be able to recreate that first feeling and do it again and again and again if you're doing it on stage, or certainly a couple of times if you're doing it on television or film. Uh, but in terms of reading uh, a script, I read a script, and I will take what first jumps off the page at me. There'll be a feeling in, in the words, the way they're written, of that character. And I will run with that until the director says stop. And you know, I, 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 you know, I pointedly say that I am not noted for my subtlety. <laughs> when, I, when I do stuff, you know, I will go well over the top with stuff, and and say, look, for God's sake, drag me back, because you know, give me rain and I will go um, in all sorts of directions with this, um, because <clears throat> that's a way of finding it. You know, sometimes by going too far with it, you can then pull back to it say, right, now that's the centre. You know. But always it'll be that initial, that initial frisson, if you like, of reading. I mean, you must know, you read books, you get an idea of a character when you're reading a book. You look at a book, you see, you see the character, you know. Um, sometimes you even, I, mean, I do it constantly, I'm, I'm misreading names, you know, and I'll be talking to somebody and say, oh, you know, it was great, you know, in Discworld when they went to Ang, Ang, Ang Fourport, <laughs> yes. you know, it's Moorport, is it? No, it's not that it was four pork. Isn't it four pork? No, it's more pork. Really? I've always read it as four pork, you know. <laughs> because in, in your excitement of reading, you will grab something and take that on board. And it's the same with characters. You will take something from a character as you're reading it that will inform how you will see that character as you're reading that book. And it's the same with radio scripts. All you then have to do is then find a voice for them. And that's, as an actor's point of view, you delve into um, a whole bag of experiences. I spend a lot of time sitting and listening to people, watching people. I do a lot of, you find a lot of actors do a lot, a lot of people watching. We tend to sometimes be very quiet. We'll just sit there in the corner of the bar watching things and just clicking it in. Going, yep, can you use that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, and, you know, things go in. Yes. When you read the script, do you hear a voice in your head and then match your voice to it? Yeah. Um, do you know, I've never really thought about that. I, I suppose I do a bit. I, 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 it'll be a delivery of voice. It'll be to do with the speed and the pitch. Um, and sometimes a character. I will, I will sometimes start from a character base and say that this sort of person, you know. Um, you know, there are people that I've drawn on in years ago. I used to work as a taxi driver in, in Birmingham, you know, where I didn't have a vast amount of work. I, I did the knowledge and ran a black cab in Birmingham. <coughs> and one of the um, um, guys I used to take out, you could, you could opt to do what they call a, a, a revenue job, where you took somebody out from the Inland Revenue who'd go around and knock on people's doors and demand money. You know, not very nice, but that's what they used to do. Um, demand payment for, you know, you know, money that they were owed. And uh, there was one guy who, he was about 24, but he came over as about 60. And he talked about himself and his, his little woman, and I had a little caravan that I used to go to on the coast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, oh, now this is an interesting one. The last time someone came here, and, uh, they set the alsatian on him. <laughs> well, I've got my bat with me today, so we'll see what happens, shall we? <laughs> you know, and you put that, and you think, well, no, no people don't like that, don't, like that don't exist, but they do. <laughs> they actually do, you know. And you, you find a character, and, and I've done, I did a, production of Birmingham Rep, of uh, <coughs> um, um, One for the Road, uh, you know, the, the, the Blue Tail, which we sat in, but set in Birmingham, not in Liverpool. And, you know, we went out and we bought these awful costumes and the sort of blind eye on and horrible and, and ghastly costumes of these terrible people who lived in this council, in this, not county, this, this supposed posh estate. And, you know, you 
come out afterwards, you know, you'd be in the bar, and somebody would walk up to you wearing almost exactly the same <laughs> costume, yeah. and go, I, God, we love that, like, you know, we know people just like that. <laughs> 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 Yes, I mentioned that. Uh, yes, I, I, I've talked. I've talked about music at the cavern uh, and various places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We covered that, didn't they? Yes. You talked about putting on character. Yes. To do a job. Yes. Do you think that was something you were doing now? Have trouble taking character off? Take it home sometimes. Um. No, not really. Um. I. I suppose. I suppose Davros is the one that I've. I, kept with, I mean, I always remember my now ex-wife always used to say, you bring that bastard home with you. <laughs> you know, you are un insufferable when you're doing, you know, a, a, a Doctor Who. You never started with Ghostbusters. No, 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 it certainly wasn't. No, it wasn't. But, uh, um, um, I suppose because any character you do has got to have an element of you. People say, well, <clears throat> you know, is that, you know, your character? I say, well, no, it's not my character, but there's, but there's got to be elements of me in it, you know. And I know from, you know, from over the years, and, and now as I'm starting to revisit things, because I'm starting to work on an autobiography, um, I realize that inside me there's a lot of anger, a lot of untapped anger. Um, and it comes out sometimes, and, uh, and I'm not aware of it, but people go, ooh, you know, uh, they're aware of it. I'm going, what, what, what's the problem? You know, you're being really heavy about it. Like, Am I? I don't need to be, honestly. You know, I'm not, you know. But and I, I, and it's to do with childhood, it's to do with all sorts of hidden things which I'm, things I'm working through anyway. So, yeah, there are darknesses within me which are obviously are going to inform the character I play. There are also lightnesses and sillinesses in me that are going to inform the character I play. <coughs> and in fact, the character I play in The Scary Fires, um, Professor, you know, Edward Dunning, who's a ghost story writer, and, um, <laughs> and uh, now works for LI-13. <laughs> um, um, in fact, Edward Dunning is the first character I ever played. The very first job I ever played in the Children's Theatre Company was a production called The Key which was a play for five to seven year olds, which revolved around the Rainbow Queen and the rainbow getting smudged. And Mr. Spectrum, who was the keeper of the rainbow box that had all the colors of the rainbow in, <coughs> had to then get the kids to help them find the colors of the rainbow, to put them back in the rainbow box to restore the rainbow. And the very first character I played was Mr. Spectrum, and Mr. Spectrum was to talk about it as well. <laughs> Why bastard? Wherefore base? My dimensions are as welcome back and mine as 
get established shape is true, there's all this matter and tissue. Why plan nails with baseness? That's the base. Who in the lusty stealth of nature does take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired way go to the created old tribe of thoughts got between sleep and wake? <laughs> One play, the one part I loved playing, and I was too young when I played it, and I'd love to play it now, or I would have loved to have played it a few years ago, um, <clears throat> but I did play it, and that was Arturo Gui, and the resistible rise of Arturo Gui, mm -hmm. which is the correct play about Hitler's rise, and in fact all the characters look like the historical characters. But Hitler, in this case, Arturo Gui, is a Chicago gangster trying to take over the cabbage um, market, uh, but it ends up in a full Nuremberg speech with a moustache and the very powerful play. And I'm glad I did that, but I did it too young. I'd love to have done it. Well, I have to make the observation. You started off with that, Ross, and unfortunately, due to time, you finished with a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Nature, thou art my goddess. <laughs>